So thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and uh, learn about MRI. Um, thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to zoom in slightly from the previous talk about 20 orders of magnitude uh, to looking at cells. And this is deep learning as a design tool in localization microscopy is, is one topic I will, I will be talking about, but as we'll see, it's a bit broader than this. So anyway, our story begins with the problem of, so by the way, this is all optical microscopy, so there's no magnetic fields here, at least not explicitly. And our, our story begins with localization microscopy. And the, the challenge is this. Um, so we have um, fluorescently labeled sample. These are microtubules in a cell. And this is the image we observed with a high NA uh, microscope. Um, it gives you the resolution of about half the wavelength. And this is not always enough. So if we want to do better than this and observe uh, finer details, we have to do some, something else. And this is where super resolution comes in. And the technique I, I'll describe here is called localization microscopy. And the idea is the following. These are, you're, you're looking at millions of fluorescent molecules right now in this image. And instead of capturing them all at once, we capture a movie in which they blink. So this is frame number one, frame number two, frame number three, and so on. The, the reason they, they blink could be, there could be diff, different ways to make them blink. So turn on and off, I won't go into that. But basically each spot you see here is a single floor. Uh, fluorescent molecule, single molecule. And now if you want to build an image out of this, this movie, then all you have to do is look at each spot, determine the position of the, of the molecule that's at the center, and just draw a dot on the right side here for each one of them. Uh, this is called localization. Okay, so you move from a diffraction limited spot that could be 200 nanometers in size to a very precise localization of that spot. And if you do this repeatedly a million times, you end up with tenfold increase in resolution and a Nobel Prize. So what happened here is that you transform from the problem from a deconvolution problem to many, many parameter estimation problems that are relatively easy to solve. The cost is that the sample had to be um, static can move while you're doing this. Okay, so you have temporal resolution of minutes. Okay, so that's it. So, I mean, that, that's the overall the story is this. You have your nanoscale limiter, you get a diffraction limited spot, but that's fine because you only care about the center, you fit this with some fitting algorithm, and that's it, and everybody's happy. Uh, in reality, what happens is often you measure something like this. So you see a bunch of molecules, low SNR because it's fluorescent and it's single molecule. So you get thousands of photons from a molecule and this could be in, in, in a good day. So this could be very noisy. And of course, you don't know how many molecules you have. They over, their point spread functions, as we've seen in the, in the last talk, they overlap. So how do you solve this overlap problem? And you're gonna get this often if you want to image quickly because then you have to, to squeeze in many localizations in a short amount of time. So over the years, many people came up with approaches of how to do this, and some of these work very well. By the way, may, um, some approaches are taken from astronomy because in astronomy, you have the problem of separating uh, sources, different stars that are adjacent. Anyway, uh, some approaches work well, but they're, they were all very computationally heavy. And when we and this was this is what brought us to this to this specific problem of overlapping emitters. And we realized this was 2017 that it's about time to do deep learning here and to use machine learning to solve this. So this is what we did, and the idea was to train a neural net. As we we've seen many neural nets, I think yesterday, so I won't go too, too much into the details. But the idea is to train a neural net that sees you know 10,000 images like this low resolution images of overlapping spots and output high resolution, that's it. So the way to train this is, um, there's two ways, either you simulate these images, which is pretty easy because the imaging model is very simple. It's just, 
you, you draw randomly uh, positions of spots, you convolve them with a 2D Gaussian or whatever your PSF model is, you add noise and that's it. And you have the ground truth, so that's pretty simple. If you wanna be more um, closer to reality, then you measure a calibration measurement and you calibrate your PSF, and then you use that to generate your training data. Or you actually sample sparse data sets of molecules that you can localize easily and you sum them together to get one dense image and then you use that as training data. So there's different ways of doing this. And so this works very well. Uh, these are just super resolution images and it's very fast because inference in these neural nets is extremely fast. Um, and also this is available online. So I don't know if anybody here is doing localization or philosophy, but if your colleagues are, then you can just use these tools. Uh, online, you don't even need the GPU because this is all on Google called App Network. So where things become really interesting is when you go from 2D to 3D. Unlike stars that are too far away to, to give away their 3D positions, uh, molecules are very close and you, you really have, you have this information in the image. So how do we exploit this? How do you get 3D imaging? So this is a model of um, microscope. You have an objective lens, a tube lens, and a camera. And the thing about this imaging system is that it's great for computational imaging. By computational imaging, I mean that what you observe uh, with your eyes is not the, the image that you're really interested in. Of course, this is a room full of MRI people, so that's all you do. Are you even measuring case space? So in optics, you can also you, you can also do this. And, I'm going to show you some applications of this idea. So where we're, the observer of your, of your object is a computer and, and not a human, unlike traditional microscopy. So you know, going back to our 3D problem, we have, you, you immediately see what the problem is. The problem is your point source, as it moves in and out of focus, becomes blurry. Blurry, and then you can't, it's very hard to localize to determine its position in 3D. So think about these blinking molecules. If they were to blink in 3D, you won't be able to see many of them. And you won't be able to, to localize them correctly. So what we do is something called point spread function engineering. Here's an example of this. This is um, a phase mask that is placed inside the microscope. I'm going to talk more about these phase masks later. Basically what it is, is like a lens, but very, very distorted. So it's so it really changes the, the optics of the system. In, and in this case, in a very specific way, such that the point spread function no longer looks like a point that goes in and out of focus and becomes blurry, the image of, of the point, the point spread function, in this case, it's two, it's two lobes that rotate uh, um, around the, the central axis as a function of Z. And so what you've done by this is you encoded depth information in this image. Now, if you want to know where in Z this molecule is, then you just capture a single image, you decode it using whatever algorithm, and you figure out the 3D position. And I'm going to show you some applications of this, but before that, um, I'll show you another point spread function, which is this one. We, we like this one, it's called the tetrapod because of the shape it traces out in 3D. And the way to, and as you can see, you know, this is just a different phase mask design. In whatever phase mask you place here, you're going to get a different point spread function. And now we can ask, okay, what, which one should I be using? What pattern should I be placing here in the, in the Fourier plane of this microscope to give me what I, what I want? So what do you want? So this specific, um, wave, um, uh, this specific phase mask was designed by, by solving an optimization problem. Okay, so the optimization problem was this. Given a finite number of, of photons that are emitted from this source, they're going to end up somewhere in this in this camera. And the question is, how should I, how should these photons be arranged in space so to uh, contain the most amount of information about the three D position of this molecule? So it's really an estimation theory problem, and you can quantify the amount of information in this shape regarding the parameter you're trying to estimate, which is Z, by a quantity called Fisher information. And it's related quantity to Kramer Rao lower bound. And if you use this, um, and, and this is basically a measure of how quickly this shape changes as a function of the focus. 
Uh, and you, if you just optimize this quantity and you tell the computer, uh, solve this optimization problem, give me the phase mass that would maximize this, then this is the result you get. So it's a local minimum, but it's the best one that I've seen so far. And so we use this use phase mask often. And so here's an example of some applications. So this is a cell, and these are its telomeres labeled uh, fluorescently. They jiggle around because it's a live cell. This is with the standard PSF, and this is with our uh, tetrapod PSF. And you see all of these sh different shapes because the telomeres are different Zs. So now you have this uh, uh, decoding problem, right? You have this big mess, and you have to figure out what's going on. So similarly to before, um, I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you figure out all of these positions at once? So similarly to before, we, we use the neural net to do this. Um, and so the idea is, again, to train on simulation and um, output this volumetric volume with zeros and ones wherever you have a point source. And that's it. So this works pretty well. And you can go back to our blinking data. And now these molecules are blinking, but each molecule is a different shape. And this shape gives you Z. So, you're, so what this blinking movie is going to yield is a 3D image in, at super resolution. And actually, I have to say, I, when I saw these results, in purple, by the way, is what the network gives you. This, this is where I really was convinced that deep learning is really useful for something we couldn't do otherwise, which, which is really solving this problem of highly overlapping emitters. Anyway, after a few thousand frames, you end up with this uh, 3D super resolution construction of mitochondria in this case. Now, the, the title of my talk was used deep learning as a design tool. So, so far I've done an image processing using deep learning. But then the next question is, can we design a better or maybe the best 3D PSF for, for this dense localization problem? Because I can't really use this Fisher information quantity I told you about when I don't know how many images I have because they could be hiding each other and overlapping in certain ways. So I had to do something else. And honestly, I don't know how to define this mathematical question of, of optimizing any combination of emitters anywhere in space. But this is where, where this uh, neural network uh, comes in very handy. Briefly, what we did is that we insert the phase mask as a, as a design parameter in the network. So while you're learning to decode the information in the images, you're also learning how to encode it. So, so the network is learning what the phase mask should be doing such that the decoding is optimal. This is called end-to-end -end optimization. And nowadays it's done uh, a lot. Um, and this is what the network gives us. So now it tells us, look, if you wanna be encoding these dense emitters, you wanna use this phase mask. Okay, so we use this phase mask. It's called the hummus because, well, because of this. This really looks like a hummus plate. And we didn't even bother coming up with the really formal name because, because as you can see, this is such a, so fluid. You know, the network can give you some other PSF or some other, uh, from some other property. So we don't get too attached to these phase masks nowadays, but we can fabricate them, we can implement them and so on. And this gives you improved results because the PSF is smaller, smaller footprint, so overlap is less of an issue. And this makes sense, but we couldn't really come up with it without having the network tell us what the optimal solution is. And so here you can see these, um, again, telomeres jiggling around, and you can have the 3D positions from the single movie. Um, I won't go too much into in details, but of course now there's variations of this. For example, you can split your imaging system into two channels, and use two different points, different points for functions at the same time. Maybe that will help you encode more information. And it does when, so here's the net learning two different channels at the same time. And it comes out to be very like complementary looking PSFs. Um, again, for solving the 3D dense localization problem, we never told the network to do this complementary thing. It just figured it out by itself. Um, yeah, so now, so now we can measure two different channels um, and, and recover a very, very dense frame field of view of, of emitters moving around. Another the interesting degree of freedom we have is, is spectral encoding. 
Uh, so let me tell you briefly about this. The idea is, however, where you implement your, your phase mask, and in this case, this is a liquid, liquid crystal spatial light modulator, which is just a programmable like screen that controls the phase in each pixel. And then that's a way to implement a pro programmable phase mask. And you can just change it dynamically if you want, although we don't do it usually. You just place a phase mask. But anyway, whatever phase mask method you use, it's going to be spectrally dependent. So the phase is a function of voltage on each pixel or, or thickness of glass or whatever it is you have there. It's going to depend on the wavelength, which means that you place some elements, some optical element there, this phase mask, and different colors are going to experience different phase delays. And then the points for the function is going to be different. Usually in microscopy, this is a problem. It's called chromatic aberration, and it's a hassle. You need to solve it. But in this case, we thought, you, you know, maybe we can exploit this. And so how do you exploit something like this? Let me show you an, a result. So these are two fluorescent microspheres. One of them is green, one is red. You don't know which is which. By the way, we don't use RGB cameras at all. We use only grayscale cameras. This is because we don't have many photons. And RGB cameras have these Bayer patterns on them that throw away a lot of the light. We can't afford that. So it's grayscale. So all of these scientific cameras are grayscale. So you measure something like this. You don't know what's red and what's green. But if you place this voltage mask or a phase mask here, you measure this. There's no Photoshop. Okay, this is really what you see with your eyes. So the idea is you can really encode a lot of spectral information <laughs> with these elements. So what happened here was the PSF of the system is such that a red um, point comes up as this shape, which is the word red, and a green point at the same time using the same element comes up as the word green. So this is a cool figure for a paper, but it's not very useful for anything. But if you, if you combine this with our tetrapod, then you really can now encode 3D and color on the same optical channel. And these are just fluorescent beads diffusing around. This guy is green, the others are red. I know because I've seen this before a few times. And this is tilted. Uh, so that's how I know it's green, OK? And you also get their 3D positions in this movie. Of course, you can now uh, learn the optimal PSF to separate different colors. And that gives you some other results as well. So now you can do, for example, um, imaging four different colors on a single channel. These are four different uh, kinds of quantum dots that emit light in, in different spectral regions. So in most of them, the, the network gets right just from the shape. So I, I want to take you and uh, uh, to think about the following problem, which is like the next step of the evolution of these things is thinking about the downstream tasks. And I would argue that maybe most of the time where we do imaging, we don't really, we're not really interested in the images. I know this might be controversial, but I think we're all, why are we imaging things? Well, we want to infer something, we want to figure out some, <coughs> something. Even in, even in medical imaging. So let me give you an, a very clear example in our case. This is a system, system we care about a lot. This, this is a yeast cell, and we label the DNA with the green and a red fluorophore at the specific points of the DNA. Because we care about this 3D distance between these points on the DNA, because it has to do with genome reconfiguration that we're interested in. So this is a system in which we don't really care what the absolute position of red and green is. We only care about the distance between them. So in principle, I don't even need an image to infer this. If I could measure something and I have some algorithm spit out a number, a scalar, that gives me the distance between these two points, I'd be happy. I don't even want to look at these images. And I want to do thousands of these cells. So what does that even mean? So the question is, how do you design an optical system that's optimal for this task? OK? And given our framework of this network-based optimization, we can do it because we have a, we're going to have an encoding net optical optics we're going to learn. We're going to have a decoding part that's not going to yield an image, it's just going to spit out the scalar number. And at this point of the project, you think, well, this, this could be really interesting or this could be pretty boring because it just might give you some, you know, what, what, could, well, what are the degrees of freedom here, really? It's just a phase mask. So the answer was somewhere in between. And um, so we let the, the network just learn this uh, in coding. 
And so green is going to give you this color and red is going to give you this color. And then if you look at simulation, what you're supposed to be measuring is stuff like that. So as a function of the position between red and green, you're going to be measuring these images. And then you have some network that takes this image and just gives you a number. So it turns out this works better than trying to encode the 3D position separately and then just calculating the number. So that's good news, but not much better. Okay, so, but still this was a very interesting thought experiment, I think, to think of optimizing things, imaging system, not for imaging, but for whatever you want to do next. So these are just some demonstrations of this. I want to, I want to finish with this um, holy grail in, uh, in this SM single molecule localization microscopy, which is to do dynamics. So the first thing I told, I told you when, when these molecules were blinking is that, that the object has to be static because you're gonna be summing up many frames, right? And then you can't have the thing moving around because you'll have motion blur as we see here. So this is a blinking movie. Um, a student alone was rotating the camera with his hand while we were measuring this. And so that's why if you just sum up all these localizations, you end up with this bad motion blur. And we have to, if, if you have dynamics in your sample, you can't just sum up frames. You have to do something else. And so we were asking if you could do from blinking video to super resolution video. Okay. And get like tens of frames per second at super resolution. That would be wonderful. And we, we're, we're get, uh, we kind of got this to work. And the idea is to use this, um, is to use neural nets again. This time, it doesn't take just single frame by frame. This is a neural net that's a recursive, uh, recurrent neural net. So it actually uses the input, uh, the output of the previous um, cell as the input of the next cell and so on. So what you do by this is, as long as you have long-term correlations in your video, so you're looking at the object that's moving around, but it's not completely crazy, okay? So it's moving in some correlated way. So there's correlations over, that, over hundreds of frames in the shape. And if you exploit that, and you kind of know what you're looking at in the sense that even microtubules, or mitochondria, whatever, and you do because you label it fluorescently, so you know what you're looking at. If you exploit these two assumptions, you can do pretty amazing things. Let me just show the results. So this is blinking data um, of live microtubules, and this is the reconstruction you get. Okay, it's hard to see, but it is moving around. Let me show it once more. If you look here, you actually get dynamics. So this is super resolution uh, reconstruction. And with mitochondria, similar results. So from SMLM, single molecule blinking, this is super resolution. Blinking. And this is at the same frame rate as the blinking. Okay, because you're not really using a single frame for reconstruction, you're using hundreds of frames. And you're interpolating all this data to uh, do sp sp spatial temporal interpolation. Okay, so I think I'll just end with this, our final step. When you build a method, you want people to use it. And when we do PSF engineering, we if we want anyone to use it, they're gonna need a phase mask. And this phase mask is a hassle to fabricate because you need lithography and that's a pain. So we came up with an approach to 3D print these things. I think this is a major step towards democratizing this approach. Uh, briefly, how this works is, well, you know this. A phase mask is just a, um, just a skyline of glass at different thicknesses um, at, you know, uh, portions of a wavelength resolution. But if you think about what's going on between uh, in this phase mask, is the reason it has to be so precise is that you have your um, material refractive index of say glass and air it's a big refractive index difference about half and this means that the phase difference between the adjacent pixels is really really large um, even if this delta thickness is pretty small so the trick that we use is instead of putting glass in air we put a polymer in a very near index match polymer another one so it's a sandwich of two materials and what happens is to get the same phase effect as before, you can now have a much, much larger thickness difference in your material. So instead of building phase masks with tens of nanometer resolution, we can build phase masks with tens of micron resolution. And this you can 3D print. So this works. Um, I don't have much time, so I'll just 
go very briefly. So yeah, it looks like this. Um, and we could do, so we could do phase mask for super resolution with this. We can do vortex plates. If, so some people are interested in getting donut beams um, also for super resolution microscopy. Uh, yeah, so now this is available. If anybody needs a phase mask, let me know. We're looking for interesting applications. Finally, I can't end without uh, going to the next scale, which is um, the great thing about academic freedom that nobody knows what you're doing. So you can build a telescope. So we built a telescope that does basically the same thing as I've shown you in microscopy. This is my car. I'm driving. It's now a famous license plate because it's been published. And what, what's happening here is the telescope is taking a monocular image of my car. The, the PSF is being engineered with this double helix phase mass. And from a single image, we can decode the distance of my car. Okay, it's just by the relative positions of, in this case, of the license plate with respect to its, to its, um, to its copy on the image. So this is image processing from a single image and you get 3D distance. This is a passive ranging. I wish we could do this for stars, but yeah, they're too far away. Okay, to summarize, I hope I convinced you that PSF engineering adds useful degrees of freedom in localization microscopy and microscopy in general, possibly. Uh, using neural nets, we can design optimal PSFs. We can control the spectral um, parameters of the PSF. We can 3D print these phase masks as well nowadays. I didn't, I didn't go into 3D imaging flow cytometry maybe next time, um, but I did tell you about the dynamics also to do spatial temporal super resolution interpolation. So this is the guys, uh, these are the guys that did the work. Um, so thank them and I would like to thank the funding and thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you very much again for the fantastic presentation. Uh, questions? One to start with. Um, really fascinating work and actually remarkable analogies to a lot of things going on in medical imaging and MRI, not just astronomy. Actually, we can talk about that. But mm -hmm. on the depth resolution problem, um, you were talking about how you could put, say, two sequential phase masks um, to explore. My mind tends to think in parallel. So why not split the beam coming off of your microscope and send them through a series of different um, phase masks, which could then disambiguate or basically can you not afford to split the beam? Do you lose too much uh, yeah. signal noise in the process? Yeah, so I, I, I tried to squeeze, to squeeze in too many things yeah. in this talk, I realized, okay. but, but actually that's what we did. We did split into two different yeah. tasks. Yes. Okay. Uh, and of course the cost, as you mentioned, is signal to noise ratio. So, I mean, in principle, why not split it into 10 different paths, right? Well, the reason is you get one tenth of the signal in each, in each channel, and at some point it's not usable anymore. I but mean, split into two we did. I mean, in principle, it adds back up. Uh, if it, 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 you know, it, it, so you could add it back up in signal averaging. I guess there's a limit where you yeah. start losing photons, right? I mean, that's so. <laughs> so now you're getting into the noise model, right? right? How much of it is Poisson noise and how much is read right. noise? And, and with our parameters, two channels were still fine. More than that, we haven't tried. Also, you know, some student has to build this thing, right? So you're going to have to split it into more than two. It's, it's becoming problematic. Gotcha. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, thanks, that was really nice. Uh, I was just wondering, once you have the engineered PSF, how would a standard deconvolution algorithm work compared to your decoder that was neural network based? Uh, are you talking about the, the 3D problem? Or just any of the problems. Once you, like you have the PSF model, mm -hmm why don't you just do standard deconvolution algorithm? Okay, so a standard deconvolution um, problem take is a 2D problem, right? So you have a 2D kernel. Remember, we have a single 2D image. Are you gonna, so if you're gonna deconvolve it with a, with a 2D PSF, you know, so you, when you do deconvolution, you assume that you, everything in your image is convolved with the same point spread function. But in the case of our 3D PSF, that, that's not the case because every point in our, in our in our uh, image is a different Z. So, you know, I mean, we can talk 
if you have an idea how to do the, how to solve this three D deconvolution from a two D image, we can talk about it. But even in the two D case, um, the neural network beats whatever deconvolution diamond. In fact, thanks. Uh, how fast these are? Uh, what do you say? The poly, uh, you know, polymer move? You know, how, how fast does what? Move, yeah, sorry? how fast these, these molecules or polymer move? You see, you can measure the distance. How fast do they move? Yeah, how fast do they move? So we, as, we assume they're, that they're moving slow enough so that there is no apparent motion blur. So this means that, for example, if our resolution is. Um, Hundred, if we have pixels of um, two hundred nanometers in, in image in image space in object space, um, then then the molecule doesn't move more than this in a, in an acquisition time, which is tens of milliseconds. If it moves faster than this, then you would get you get the motion blur in the motion. In the blinking movie, there is no motion. In, uh, I don't, oh, you're, are you talking about the, the reconstruction of the the dynamic you reconstruction? Model, you see the, the, the atoms or particles move. Right? Yeah. You know how the plane, the pulse, what's the speed? Yeah. So, so I would say not not more than than um, a micron a micron for tens of milliseconds. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank our uh, speaker again.